All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Oscar Yao, and I'm on the Investments and Capital Markets team here. Today is Monday, February 26th, and we are just two days removed from the 2024 Lantern Festival, which marks the 15th and final day of the traditional Lunar New Year celebrations. I was actually in San Francisco on Saturday watching the annual Chinese New Year parade, and in carrying forward the celebratory spirit of good fortune and the start of spring, we are super excited to host this talk with our three guests. First is Abigail Heng Wen. Abigail was actually here at Google about four years ago uh, to talk about crafting Asian American stories uh, when she published her New York Times bestseller, Love Boat Taipei. That book, which is the first of a trilogy, was recently turned into a movie titled Love in Taipei. And today we are lucky to have her back alongside two amazing actresses from that film, Ashley Liao and Chelsea Zhang. A few words about our speakers. Abigail is an author, filmmaker, and woman in tech leader specializing in artificial intelligence. She holds a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard, a JD from Columbia Law School, as well as an MFA in writing from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. In her career spanning law, venture capital, and tech, she's negotiated multi-billion dollar deals from Wall Street to Silicon Valley. And that's all before making her mark in the arts and being described as one of the voices of our generation. Wow, that's uh, certainly hard to follow, eh? But fear not, because we're just as amazing as our second guest, Ashley, who has been acting since the age of 13 in both TV and film. Best known for her role as Lola in Fuller House, Ashley has also guest starred on numerous shows, including NCIS, NCIS LA, Speechless, uh, Fresh Off the Boat, and Bad Teacher, among others. She can currently be seen in The Hunger Games, Ballad of the Songbirds and Snakes, and of course, in the lead role of Ever Wong in Love in Taipei. Uh, she's from Orange County and is a recent graduate of the UCLA Communications Program. Uh, last and certainly not least, we have Chelsea Zhang, a multiple time film award winner and nominee who plays Sophie Ha in the movie. She made her debut in 2012's The Perks of Being a Wallflower and has appeared in numerous shows and films, including Netflix's Daybreak, HBO Max and DC Universe's Titans, Disney Channel's Andy Mack, the award-winning film Relish, and many more. Uh, Chelsea comes to us from Pittsburgh and later studied business at USC. All right, I'm so excited to welcome our speakers and would encourage everyone to also type in your questions in the YouTube live chat. So without further ado, please welcome Abigail, Ashley, and Chelsea. Hello, everyone. No, thanks so much for joining us. This is a really special time, and you know, I really uh, appreciate your, your taking time off uh, to join us here. Um, okay, I mean, starting with Abigail, firstly, uh, a warm welcome back to Google. It's great to see you here again. Uh, and having just, you know, read your bio again, it's really hard to believe that this is all just one person. Uh, I, I personally love the quote that Forbes used to describe you as a person with a knack for trying and succeeding in new things. So I'd love to just start off by having you tell us a little bit more about your multifaceted career as well as the journey to where you are today. Well, thank you so much, Oscar, and thank you to all of Google. Um, you know, as you said, I was here four years ago, and it really has been the support of folks and influencers in this audience that helped us get all the way to the screen. So I'm grateful, and I'm so glad to be back here today. Um, you know, I kind of joke that if I had um, published sooner, I probably wouldn't have had this multifaceted career. I didn't know I could be a writer. Um, growing up, I, I loved to read. I loved watching movies, but I never saw any stories um, about the things that I knew. I thought books were things about things I didn't know. Um, and I, I, know I read to learn, I didn't know I could write about things that were close to home. And I never saw any authors um, like me. So it wasn't something I ever considered as a career, but I you know, I told the story of planning to be a law professor. Um, I'd done everything to do that. I'd clerked on the DC circuit and I'd written a law article and um, you know, done the law review, but I just couldn't bring myself to write that other article I needed to write to get onto the market. Um, but I had an idea for a fantasy novel in my head, and I started writing that instead, and it just came pouring out of me. And so that's when I realized, oh, wow, I, I didn't know I was creative. I didn't know I had all these stories in me. Um, but it would take me 10 years to publish Love Boat Taipei. So I wrote five novels on the way here. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I had published sooner, I wouldn't have had this extensive career. But in the meantime, I did work in law. I worked in venture capital. I worked in artificial intelligence. And I have now draw on all those skills and all that knowledge to do the work I'm doing now. No, that's fantastic. And I, I resonate with you, even for me growing up, actually YouTube was one of the outlets where I was able to see a lot of like Asian American creators and, and you know things that I resonated with. 
Uh, so personally, I'm a musician as well. And for me, I'm always looking for ways to combine my you know, finance and business experience alongside technology and music and the things that I'm working on. So my, my question for you is, for, you know, at this point, having had this multifaceted career, what is the ideal blend for you uh, in, the, in the project that you, you're working on and more importantly, in the impact that you want to be making? Uh, you know, that from AI to VC and media, what's that blend that you want to, you want to see? So I I've officially left my corporate role about two and a half years ago. It was right actually after we greenlit Love in Taipei uh, to move forward. Um, and you know what, which is interesting for me to find is filmmaking is actually a confluence of three things in my life. One is creative storytelling, two is finance, and three is technology. Um, especially nowadays, there's so much interesting new technologies around it. So that actually in some ways is a really cool blend for me um, because it allows me to have a more integrated life. Um, I have an infinite number of stories in me. And fortunately I have a wonderful team that tells me like do that project next and save that one for like 10 years from now when it, cause it's too expensive. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I am. I'm, I'm creating a lot more content. I'm starting a studio and I'm continuing just to, to put out stories in the world and find different creative partners for each of them. That's that's so awesome. No, I, I look forward to, to you know, more uh your, your next book and uh you know, more movies to come as well from your studio um you know on that topic a little bit can you tell us a little bit more about the process of turning you know this novel into a film there's obviously you know some plot differences and all that but what are some other facets that we can that we on the outside may not uh you know be aware of and, you know just the whole process itself yeah it is a really involved process and you know Writing a book is just you, your agent, and the editor. And really, at the end of the day, you make the final calls on, on everything, even down to the last copy edits, even if I'd rather not make those calls. Okay. Um, but with a movie, it's 300 people. It really is. And I think that's what's been the, the interesting challenge and also the fun part of it. Like everyone, every one of those 300 people are actually really instrumental to making this final product. And everyone brings their own creative talents and sensibilities. And so in a lot of ways, it's a project that takes on a life of its own. And I think you see that reflected in um, in the storyline, the way the story ended up evolving for the final version. Um, but yeah, kind of the process was as soon as we announced the book, um, the scouts started calling, the studio started calling, and I, I talked to a number of producers who had different visions, like, is this going to be a musical or a you know straight up film? Is this going to be um, TV versus feature film? Sure. And um, you know, once we chose a producer, the next thing was finding a screenwriter. Um, we I heard so many different takes, which was really magical just to hear like, all these different creative visions for how, which way this story could go and what kind of cool visuals we can incorporate. Um, but dance, I think was the really, the part that we are all most excited about and like, how can we really build that in? Um, so then after the screenplay was written, that was a lot of drafts. Um, we uh, we got the green light, it got, we run in our director, Arvin Chen, and then we got to cast. And that's when I finally first got to see Chelsea and Ashley. That's, that's so cool. Uh, it's definitely a lot more that goes into that sausage making than I uh, originally thought. Just curious, did you did you think about being the screenwriter yourself, having you know written the book, or was there a conscious uh, effort to have you know someone else uh, you know work on this as well? Yeah, so for for this one, um, I wasn't ready to do the screenplay. Um, I was actually really thrilled to have other people who were more experienced um, bring kind of their creative talents to the process. But I do have other scripts that I'm working on that I think it just depends on the particular project um, how I want to approach it. No, that's that's awesome. Uh, all right, no thanks, Abigail. Uh, and I guess continuing the trend of the extremely high performing and multi talented. I'd love to turn it over to Chelsea. Uh, I, I see that you know you were a competitive figure skater in your preteens, and you were accepted into USC when you were just 16 years old. So that's that's super cool. I would you know I just love love for you to tell us a little bit more about your experience growing up and you know juggling both your studies as well as your uh, acting career and, and how that all came together. Yeah, that's so sweet of you to say. Um, I, I am very extremely appreciative of how I grew up and that my parents just exposed me to a lot. So the figure skating was like a little interest that I had and they invested in that. So I got to experience that and it kind of was like a whole other life. Um, and then growing up, I honestly juggled acting and academics for a while. Um, I'm sure Ashley has like personal experience doing this too. It's like, you don't know where you might end up, but you enjoy both. And I think there's a, interesting level of health that comes from that because you learn not to like get one of them to turn one of them into like a god or like have it consume you like i'm sure ashley and i know it's like you go home after you could be filming and it's like you still have roommate problems you figure out how to be yourself you attest it, it keeps you humble and it reminds it gives you that perspective that actually is healthier for you in the end 
Um, but it is a dream to be able to um, do something that you love at the end of the day. So yeah, it's a balance, still figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And it's a, it's a great, you know, uh, way to keep you grounded, but also, you know, uh, do what you love as well. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, double clicking on this a little bit, you know, again, as a musician, I'm often involved in talks and stuff about how useful a non-traditional or an artistic background can be in the field of business and corporate America. Uh, so on the flip side, I'm curious to uh, to see whether you found that your, your business degree has come in handy at all in your artistic career, you know, obviously besides maybe negotiating for a bigger bag or something. <laughs> I have great agents that do that for me, thank God, <laughs> because I'm like, ah, I'm like, yes, I'll work, um, but they're great. <laughs> um, I will say, like, this is something that I've been chewing on more, more recently, because for a while, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this business degree, but I think being immersed in, like, huge communities of artists has actually shown me where the business degree comes in, because you meet I love artists like they just have such a pure motive to like bring about connection or a story and they they just want to do it but this world is is structured and it has like money is involved and so there needs to be a voice that's advocating for them and be able to find financing like Abigail was saying like it, it that voice um, needs to exist and I think like business without the art is kind of like soul sucking and then like <laughs> art without business is not sustainable so there's like really good potential for collaboration there and um you know i want to create abigail like starting a studio is so inspiring i think um we all need to just encourage each other to like start and make those ideas and concepts into like real projects and that takes a community so it's uh i think there's like positive opportunity ahead Oh, that's that's awesome, and I, I totally resonate with that as mm -hmm. well. Uh, all right, so turning it over to to Ashley, uh, you know, from from actors to dancers and musicians, this is a career that can start incredibly early on. And as someone, you know, I think who started acting at such a young age and having sort of grown up, I guess, on set and working a little bit, uh, what was that like, and how did that impact kind of your development into adulthood and as well as your career? Yeah, I mean, I think about all the time of the person that I would have been if the industry hadn't gotten to me first, I think. I, I started acting and doing commercials at age 10. So I've currently been doing this for longer than I haven't been. So I don't really quite remember what my life was like before that, but I have to trust that um, my mom made the right decision in putting me into community theater. She tells the story and she's like, you know, some parents put their kids into gymnastics or soccer because they have too much energy. Uh, we put you into musical theater because you were too dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I just, I remember not wanting to audition and being really nervous, but ultimately really loving it. And I think past a certain point, like the lines didn't really feel like lines anymore. It just kind of felt like the right thing to say. And that's when I knew like maybe something was going on here. And, you know, my mom tells me all the time that like statistically speaking, like I should not be where I am and have this career. And I'm sure, you know, anyone that works in this industry kind of feels the same way where, you kind of do it long enough and you're just like, wow, like, I, I can't believe it's been this many years. And then to be able to juggle school and to be able to, you know, kind of take off all of these like life boxes and goals that I like really wanted to accomplish. Um, it's been just incredible. And I'm, I'm so lucky. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. My mom's a, a piano teacher. So that's definitely how I got started as well. And my dad is a mathematician. So I guess mm -hmm. I, I got a little bit of both as, as did you guys as well. Um, my, my second question for you is, you know, uh, as mentioned earlier, Love in Taipei is the movie rendition of Love Boat, uh, Taipei, the first novel in this young adult uh, trilogy. Uh, but obviously we, we can't mention uh, teen novel tri trilogies uh, into film adaptations without stating with uh, the OG, kind of the Hunger Games, of course. So, you know, obviously for you now, looking back on these last two projects, what's it like now being part of both of these worlds and what were some of the similarities and, and takeaways that you can draw from your, your time on each of these projects? I mean, you can probably just tell, like, I think my reaction is, is very much the same every single time, which is like, I can't believe that um, two incredible, incredible books that I have poured my heart into reading and also scripts that were just incredible to see. And now there's a film version of, of both of these, you know, New York Times bestselling novels. And 
once again, I'm just, I'm so thankful and I'm like lucky. And I just can't believe that, you know, Abigail, you know, saw ever in me enough to be like, Hey, we want her. And that, um, <laughs> Our director, Francis Lawrence, for Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, you know, saw enough of Clemencia in me to be like, we want her. And um, I'm just extremely overwhelmed with the reception of both and uh, the messages that I get. And I'm sure, you know, Chelsea, you get these too. And Abigail, you get these from from Asian American girls that are just like, I can't believe that now there's there's people that look like me on screen. And I think that that's been the biggest change that I've seen in the past, you know, over the decade that I've, I've been in this industry is that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities now for people that are Asian American. I mean, I'm cheering on Greta Lee for, our, um, for uh, the Oscars nomination too. And so I'm just like amazed that we were at this point and, and extremely humbled and grateful. Yeah, well, now you kind of know how I feel because I was re-watching the movie just over the weekend and I'm now I'm getting to talk to you guys. So this is a, a super cool experience for me. Uh, and, and, you know, building on the, the topic here of, of representation that you touched on a little bit, I'm, you know, encouraged to see that there have been more and more diverse stories being told recently, as well as, uh, as you mentioned, recognition, especially for Asian and Asian Americans uh, on the global stage. Uh, just, you know, I'm just wondering, and this is for all three of you, I'm wondering if you guys could share, you know, a little bit about your viewpoint on how this is evolving and what empowers you to tell your story, pursue your craft, and how can we as a community uh, build on this to continue having more representation and diversity in uh, media and entertainment? Yeah, well, I, I'm happy to start. You know, I think we really have our, our predecessors to thank. You know, we had Joy Luck Club over, I guess it's been 30 years now, and then 25 years later, there was Crazy Rich Asians, and those really did open doors for us. Um, you know, Jenny Han's done amazing work, and, and I think with these giants, we stand on their shoulders and they were able to start to prove out like, hey, there is demand for diverse stories and, you know, stories like Hamilton that have diverse audience, diverse cast, they can actually find general audiences. Um, you know, we, I would have said a couple years ago that we weren't there yet. Um, a couple years ago, one of my um, writing friends um, had a contract in Hollywood that said they could still change her Chinese American girl to a white character for marketing reasons. And that really was very recent. Um, but it's exciting how much things have changed. I think there has been a reckoning in Hollywood and in publishing that people do want and are thirsty for authentic stories um, that they can see themselves in. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I don't know if Chelsea or Ashley, you guys have anything to add, but that was a, a great answer. Um, I, I guess, you know, I guess for, for the two of you, you know, moving on to the movie a little bit, uh, you know, throughout the film, we, we see, you know, ever being immersed in Taiwanese culture during her summer there, and in turn, you know, in a way, fighting herself. I know that the story itself is inspired by Abigail's personal experience participating in the Love Boat Study Abroad program, uh, but I'm curious as to whether the two of you have ever experienced something similar of the sort of a cultural exchange, or do either of you guys have a moment or experience where you remember making this connection to your culture and uh, di discovering yourselves? So we, can, we can start with Chelsea. <laughs> Yeah, Chelsea, do you want to get up? <laughs> um, yes, of course. Um, yes, I totally did. I grew up in Pittsburgh. It's kind of like ever, like <laughs> middle nowhere, East Coast. And so I was minority for sure. I was predominantly white. And the like the majority of Asian people, we all kind of like were similar in a sense of like we were assimilating. And so my idea of Asians even was so small. It was just what I knew. And there was obviously underlying, you know, ideas that we were impacted by just like living in the cities that we lived in. So um, huge two moments for me were like going to the West Coast and living at USC and being surrounded by other Asian Americans that were so like similar to me and diverse at the same time. Um, and then going to, for me, it was Shanghai. I remember it very clearly, but any kind of major um, thriving Asian city will just give you a different perspective on your own culture. Um, Cause I, I was just like, this is amazing. Like it's brilliant. Um, and to be, you know, many and to see it, the city thriving and all the innovation and design that they have, I was just like so proud to be Asian and Chinese at the time. and. Um, I would come back and I'm just like, ha like now I'm like, have you been to Asia? Cause like you're missing out, you know, and now there's like a context to what I came from and 
I think traveling, experiencing that, um, that perspective is like invaluable. So for me, totally had a love boat experience. Awesome. What about you, Ashley? You know, I didn't know that love boat as a concept was something that was just larger than outside of my family. Um, I, I, my dad had, you know, friends that went to love boat that went to Taiwan. Wow. And so, you know, being Taiwanese American, I think that getting to see Taiwan in such a different light, like Chelsea, you know what it's like when you visit family in Asia and you're like, all right, it's very different than when we were there uh, in Taipei for work. And so, you know, having been to Taiwan to visit family um, versus being there for work, very different. A lot more fun, maybe. <laughs> when you're there, a lot more disco lights, I think, when you're there for work, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it, it really did feel like I was kind of living this, this role of ever while I was there filming her part, um, getting to be in Taiwan and have these new experiences that felt very much like something that I knew from my past, but also very new and um, exciting. And so a lot of her, a lot of her um, like dialogue felt very much just like, this is something that I literally was saying yesterday <laughs> at the night market. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's awesome. And actually similar to you, Chelsea, I, my, my first time back to Asia was for a music festival uh, that I was participating in. That, that was when I was uh, 14 years old in Shanghai. And that was, I remember just like, yeah, I remember getting off the plane and immediately getting hit by some a warm gust of wind and starting to sweat. And I'm like, oh, here we go. The humidity. Like, yeah, but it was, it was yes, it was a, a July. Uh, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a fantastic trip and I coupled that with seeing my family as well. So it was, it was certainly an eye-opening uh, ex experience for sure. Um, yeah, so I guess without giving too much away, I know I got to meet you guys a little bit before this talk. Uh, but your respective characters, Ever and Sophie, uh, have very different personalities, especially at the beginning, where Sophie is very bubbly. I still love your uh, your introduction, Sophie, ha, like, ha, ha. And, uh, and, and Ever is a little bit more cautious and, and sheltered. Just curious, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you guys are like in the real world and how your respective upbringings shaped what you brought to your characters in the movie as well? Yeah. I can see you go. Yeah. No, I know you. I'll start and then she'll fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, yeah. Um, it's funny because I definitely felt like ever growing up, I think. Mm -hmm. um, definitely reserved, definitely cautious. Um, the thing that I think I do have a very bubbly personality. I think I've chilled out a little as I've grown up. <laughs> I call it like my outer shell. It's like if you first meet me and I, because I, I just, I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of like a really excited person and like fun. And I, I've always felt very welcomed. And so I think I take that on um, maybe as like a little ple people pleasing. <laughs> but um, I think I adopted that just growing up because I knew I, I loved making people happy and enjoyable and relaxed and like making them laugh. So I had a big pivotal personality shift. I feel like when I joined cheerleading, cause like I was, oh. I like joined the cheerleading squad and then I think it became my whole personality for a while. So I picked up a lot of that, but um, I do love Sophie and I think she is like an outer layer of myself. So it was very easy to tap into that, but growing up very much ever. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I I think that, you know, getting to play Ever and kind of be in her shoes of figuring out what she wants, it almost kind of aided me in my own life. You know, I, I tell the story a lot of like how I, when we went to Taiwan to film, went to Taipei, filmed, and um, I was still finishing up school at that time. I was still, you know, enrolled. And so I woke up at two in the morning, Taipei time to take a final um, LA time, you know, fell back asleep. And then I woke up for work and, you know, that was kind of just the, the day, I guess, you know, yeah, and so right. I very much felt like I had to choose between like arts or the academics and, you know, especially before I knew for sure that I was going to go to UCLA, it was very much like, did I want to go to college? Did I feel like I had the time for it? Am I going to miss out on opportunities in my work because I want to go to sure. school? Is it worth that sacrifice? Um, but I think what this story has kind of told me is like when you have your heart there, I think ultimately that's kind of what is going to lead you and nothing could keep ever from dancing, just like nothing's hopefully ever going to be able to keep me from this fantastic entertainment industry. And, you know, I, 
it, it very much felt like I, I was able to kind of process my own life moment through her. Learned a lot. No, that's that's amazing. And and one last question, and this is for all three of you. Growing up, uh, was there like a, ever a boy wonder in your life that you were always compared to, or actually having now chatted with you guys, were you guys the recluse of your family and friends? Uh, well, I will I will say that um, Boy Wonder is partially based on my husband, um, who oh, turns wow. out was a, he was a piano prodigy. Like I think he placed um, number two in Houston when he was seven or eight. I didn't even know though because he never told me he could play piano until our third year of marriage. <laughs> and he kind of right. out. He's full of full of surprises. Yeah, he actually yeah. turns out he's some semi tone deaf, so it was like more torture than anything else for him. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there were always like a, there was like a couple like Asian American guys that were a few years older than me in the Cleveland area where I grew up. And so my parents would talk about them like, oh, you know, so-and-so is doing such and such. And um, and also like, maybe you should date them. But um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I think I have been boy wonder to others um, for better or worse. And so, um, you know, I, I think what I try to do with that responsibility is like, you know what, I'm actually also very human and it's, it's not been an easy journey. Um, really, I think at the end, what makes you what makes you successful? And I think Chelsea Nash would agree is that you keep going and you keep trying and you keep auditioning and putting yourself out there and getting rejected. Um, and eventually you find the projects and the people that resonate most with you. I'm not sure, Abigail, if you have if you have children, but I'm I'm curious uh, if you ever compared uh, you know uh, or have any boy wonders that you compare your 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 kids to. Oh, I hope I don't do it, but I probably have let it slip out <laughs> somewhere or the other. I think the world of the actors and actresses that joined Love in Taipei. So I probably talk about them a lot. There we go. <laughs> um, I think when I think about maybe not boy wonders, but girl wonders in my life, I definitely think about Abigail. Um, when I think about people that I know that put so much of themselves into everything that they do that I look up to immensely, not just in terms of, you know, the, the um, business path that you've had, Abigail, but also just, you know, also being an artist and, and creating definitely my girl wonder for sure in the best way possible. <laughs> That's so beautiful. And I would say like, I feel like I had a boy wonder or a girl wonder in like every avenue of my life as like <laughs> motivation it was like whatever you did like the, oh don't forget that this person exists and i think it's just like a funny like my parents from china and like it's just like a tactic i think that they don't know but they just want you to be great they want you to have motivation and i think even yeah like meeting abigail and meeting other people and learning how that motivation slightly you know in a different perspective is way more encouraging and that's like where you meet your boy wonders, you see your girl wonders, and then they're like advocating for you. Like yeah. that's way more powerful than this competitive nature. So it, it has good intentions. And I, yeah, I agree. It's like meeting people that are so supportive is that's the fire that we need to like do more with for our like little assembly people. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think that's awesome. And personally, I know some friends who, uh, you know, their boy wonders were, were their dads. Like, oh yeah, I walked, to school uphill every way, you know, you gotta, gotta, gotta keep up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <no. laughs> but yeah, I guess uh, switching gears a little bit, you know, so I used to uh, analyze the media industry from a stock picking perspective and, you know, both movies and books were always viewed as, you know, rather risky endeavors, right? It takes a ton of up upfront effort and investment uh, and, and months and, and years of work to, to craft something so personal and meaningful. So I'd love to get your guys' view, you know, obviously from actually working on these, how do you all deal with things like writer's block or the equivalent of actor's block or, uh, you know, keeping projects a secret, uh, going back and forth with editors and producers, and mainly just having so much patience, but at the same time, also hoping that all your efforts uh, and hard work will be able to, you know, touch the hearts of audiences and, and readers when it's finally released. You know, what's that process like for all you, uh, for, for all of you? Ashley, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Yeah. Um, actor's block. I think that that's a great way to put it, where sometimes I just feel like, like there, sometimes it just feels like there's an emotion that has to come out. And Chelsea, you might feel this too, where you're like, it'd be great if I had an audition right now where I could just cry. Um, it'd be so awesome. Um, so I feel that a lot. And I think the way that I try to get back in touch with 
with my inner actors by reconnecting my humanity to other people's. And I realized that like, if we keep realness of, of wanting to tell a story and, and have that be our passion and keep that at the center that I think um, the rest of it kind of just falls into place. And in terms of writer's block, um, Abigail, I don't know how you wrote an entire novel. I've written like two 30 page scripts and I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> Good luck. It's a short, you guys. I'm not doing any more. 16 <laughs> minutes, I'm done. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I, when I get writer's block in that sense of like wanting to write like a script, usually I'll just go out and live life. I think that as an actor, one of the best things you can do to kind of broaden your horizons is just live and kind of think about what those emotions feel like and kind of how that looks from the outside and what it means to be, you know, authentically acting, but also living. Yeah. Chelsea, what do you do when you get actors block? <laughs> I think you you put it really well, like you were very well versed in that. And I, yeah, I think so much of it is that real connection with humans. Like even with us, it's like we get self tapes all the time and it's like removed the humanity and the, the connection and the story from a lot of it. And so practicing just having real connections with people and even in your scenes, like really trying to connect with who you're talking to changes everything but I think a big thing too is just releasing the expectations of it even with the movie it's like we filmed different versions like we don't know like what it was gonna be so there's like such a freedom in letting the art play out and you know there's factors beyond your control and so you know you you manage what you can control and then let it go <laughs> no that's that's awesome and, and yeah and it's uh everyone has their own way of dealing with it, but I think you guys all have have it figured out to a certain extent, at least. <laughs> um, and, and you know, I, I know we're getting close to uh, close to time for audience questions, but I wanted to squeeze one more in, you know, specifically to this movie. What was it like, you know, filming during the pandemic, uh, especially, you know, uh, in, in Asia, where I hear, you know, things were a little bit more intense in terms of testing and and, and stuff. So, love to to hear your your experiences from that. Well, we were so fortunate. Um, we, you know, we did all three of us did the two week quarantine in Taiwan. The borders were closed, um, but this is the time when the whole world was locked down. Yeah. And once we were through that two week quarantine, which was kind of a whole experience on its own, um, we were free. <laughs> we were free to live life like normal, and that was huge and magical. And the cool part is we got to do it together. Like, yes, we we did have to PCR test three times a week, and that was painful. Um, we, had, <laughs> we had we actually hired twenty additional staff just to manage COVID on set. So they were policing wow. masks. They changed our masks every few hours. Um, we had special foods that we probably didn't really need, but that that was just part of the, the protocol. So we had like special food that was, I don't know, tested or something. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think getting to live life like normal is really more the experience than anything else. Like and that's what that's what it meant to film at the height of pandemic. I think pandemic also protected us because we um, no one could visit us. It was just, it was a closed set. Um, we did have a couple of few guests get special permission to come on board, but otherwise, um, I think that's probably why we bonded so tightly. It was us on set, and then we got to experience Taipei and the night markets and the clubs together. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, you guys got to go to, you know, the clubs were open and night markets. Oh, that's everything awesome. was open. Try going to the club with your mom. Like, it was <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Not only was she there for the scenes when we were filming in the 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 um the, uh, the clubs at, what, 2 yeah. in the morning? I'll see you remember that day, but she was also at the actual clubs too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have nothing much to add, but the quarantine was pretty was pretty gnarly. Like I think about it now, like when someone's like, "If you had to go back," I think I, my body has like a reaction to being stuck in a box for two two weeks. Yeah, yeah no. Obviously, Maybe. fingers crossed that we're we're continuing to you know, go in the right direction there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chelsea, yeah, I was impressed I, that you um you brought weights or you had them bring you weights, and so I I, I asked I, for I a bike, a bike. Okay. Yeah, I was Smart. like, I need to move, and I was like dancing in my room. We and Ashley <laughs> had our like daily wave across. The I was toasting bread using my flat iron. <laughs> I don't so, know. How. <laughs> oh wow! Listen, I got really resourceful in those two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say that's that's part of the uh the, the college experience as well, right? It was it was kind of fun. It was kind of miserable. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, yeah, being resourceful for sure. Uh okay, I think we're ready for our first uh audience question. Uh Sarah, if you want to bring that up. Yes, it's come to us from uh, Akanksha. 
uh, question to Abigail, what motivates you to continue your different pursuits and what would you like to be known for? That's a deep well, yes. have a hard question. So I guess the motivation, um, I, I don't know exactly. I think I have a lot of stories in me that I that they just want to come out. And so I, I don't feel like settled until I've written in a certain day. Um, I think I just, I want to do a lot. I, I get, I'm interested in a lot of things. And so I pursue all those interests um, as they tug at me. And then in terms of representation, that's always been really important to me in all the industries I've worked in. I would think about women and leadership and the implicit biases that we face. And I went through everything as, a, you know, my career in law and my career in tech. Um, and just like feeling, wow, there's so much, there's so many bridges that we need to build. There's so many communication gaps we need to close. And you know, one example is when I was a young associate, we were given a thousand dollars to spend on business development, and I and I remember getting audited. Um, and I, the person auditing me was an office manager. He said, "I don't understand what baby shower gifts have to do with business development." And I remember being really surprised. I'm like, "Well, these women are going to go back to work, and they're brilliant and incredible. Like that is business development. Like I didn't buy sports tickets. Right? I bought baby shower gifts. Um, but there were so many stories like that." throughout my career um, that I feel like, you know, it's just a matter of explaining, like we need to explain like how we're different, like why we're doing things the way we're doing. And so I really see that as part of my mission. Like my goal is to be part of bringing about a more reconciled world. And so, um, yeah, I guess that's maybe the answer to the second part of the question is I do, I want to do that. I want to bridge, bridge people. I want to bring about a more um, understanding, compassionate, reconciled world. Oh, I, I, I love that. I think that's, uh, that's, that would be great to be known for that. Yes, of course. Um, I guess moving on to our, our second audience question um, from Mackenzie. Uh, this is for Ashley and Chelsea. She'd love to hear about what kinds of roles excite you guys and what you look for in scripts when you are considering joining a project. Maybe Chelsea? I think it's always refreshing when any character you go out for is just like multi-dimensional, which feels like the floor of a standard. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, it's so nice when you get to explore more um, beyond, you know, looks or what they do. And like, and like, even for someone like Sophie, like it, it'd be cool to explore more like, yes, she's bubbly, but like, I'm bubbly, but I'm also not bubbly sometimes. And like, what are the underbellies of everyone? Because everyone has dimension. So I love dimensional stories, obviously characters like that. And then I personally love like mother daughter relationships. Because <laughs> there's like sore spots and relationships in general, just family dynamics and those kind of sto like family stories really move me like the farewell and um, yeah. Lady Bird's one of my favorite movies. So I, I think those are just like uh, really just tender places in my heart. When I think about roles that excite me and like what kind of things I hope to do uh, in this career, um, I, I was talking with my, my team about this earlier. I was like, I really would love a panic attack on screen, like something in me. I don't know what it is right now. I would love to be able to just like go for it and just like let loose, you know? Um, I would love to just cry in a scene. <laughs> Horror also I think is really intriguing right now too. I uh, did that really loud scream um, for the Battle of Sovereigns and Snakes. Won't spoil why, but really loud scream. And I think we did that maybe like 30 times that day. And I didn't lose my voice because, you know, years of like all these like singing lessons taught me to like project from your diaphragm, not from the throat, you're going to lose your voice. And so that has been intriguing very ever since to just like do a horror. I would love to see what goes on behind the scenes because um, I think horror is very interesting to watch. I don't like being scared personally. So <laughs> like, like, when I go behind all of that. I would love to see it then. Um, but in terms of like what I look for in a script when considering joining a project, I think that telling, like Chelsea said, like a really deep, like real story, I think is something that really attracts me. I think more than like superhero comic um, things where like, you know, everyone is always here to save the day. I love seeing incomplete people. I love, I loved watching past lives where it's just like, wow, this is so much like my own personal experiences. And I love films where you leave the theater and you're like, I gotta, I gotta rethink a few things. <laughs> you know, I love that. That's right. I'm just curious from my from my own perspective, do you guys have a preference towards wanting to be in more TV shows or, or films? Or, you know, I, I, it's probably definitely a different experience. 
Yeah, you know, I think you're definitely possibly tied down a lot more with um, television, but with that also comes consistency and um, in an industry that is volatile at times, as we just saw, like, you know, a lot of us didn't work for a couple of months, Chelsea, you know this, um, that consistency is key. Um, but I also, I love a movie too. I love just in and out, you know, two, two and a half hours that is the entire thing and just being able to close that book when it's done i love that um so i think both definitely have their advantages yeah i would so agree with the consistency thing and i almost i think nowadays the line is a little blurred with the artistry between like tv and film and so i almost think it's like important to look at who you're working with it's like mm -hmm. i would love to work with just like a director um i mean arvin was great but even just like directors that like give you so much breathing room and it's like a like you can just play with them i feel like that'd be so um exciting and some tv shows the creators will will let you do that too so i think it's also cool to just see the environment that you're going to be stepping into and that could be a tv or a film god no that, that makes a lot of sense uh i guess you know on the topic of this being a somewhat volatile industry uh you know over the past little while We've, you know, we've seen continued shifts in the general media landscape, right? From further consolidation, joint ventures, uh, writers and actors strikes uh, and, and stuff like that. Just in your opinion, uh, again, for all three of you, I'm curious, you know, do you have a view on where you see this industry in the next five to 10 years, both you know, with regards to like how many streaming platforms are left or cable TV viewership trends or you know, movie goer trends and, and stuff. Just curious to get your guys' thoughts on it from the, uh, from the inside. Maybe we'll start with Abigail. What do you think? Well, I think we will still we will see more and more diverse content, which I'm thrilled at. I think we're really proving out that there is a demand for um, for these stories. Uh, I think we'll see more consolidation. There's so many streaming platforms now, and you know there's a lot more talk about M and A and just you know I think it's 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 a struggle to make a streaming platform profitable. Yeah, that's um, right. But um, but you know on the other hand, like there is a value to the storytelling and film work that we're doing um, beyond profit. Like, I mean, obviously I come from Silicon Valley where venture capital is, is it's all about the profit. Um, but, you know, the, one of the biggest deals in Hollywood is Pixar and it really did not compare to like the valuation of Slack or any of these other big tech companies. Um, and that's not why you go into the arts. Like you go because there is a bigger mission. Um, it's about taking control of the narrative and changing culture, exporting culture and, you know, helping people um, come to a deeper understanding of themselves and of each other. And so I don't, I hope I don't think that will ever change. I think that's been, you know, going on since since the very first operas were performed in Greek theaters. So, um, yeah, and I'm I'm so glad to be a part of it. Awesome. No, that I think that's a that's a great answer, and and you know, we're obviously hoping for the same as well. Uh, we have time for one more audience question. This one comes from Janelle. Uh, you know, has a fan ever said something that really stuck out with you, or stuck out to you? I guess, or a piece of advice from someone in the industry. You can just put, you know, everything I said today, because I'm a big fan, of course. <laughs> See, when I think about things that people have said that have really, I think, stuck with me, um, particularly with fans, I think that, you know, growing up, we didn't have a lot of people that look like us. And I think that there weren't a lot of people that wanted to be open and honest and tell our stories. And now this is something that people are not only um, getting access to, but that they're actively seeking out. And, um, yeah, I've, I've got some DMs from girls that are like, you know, my age and people like, especially from like Fuller House and things like that, who are just like, you were the first time I ever saw anyone that looked like me. And that just makes me want to cry, you know, because it's like, we go into it because we love the craft, but also if you can kind of fill in some other gaps along the way of representation and having people see themselves in you and know that it's possible, um, then, you know, why not? It's just, it's like the frosting on the cake. Yeah, I had a similar experience. Jane Lee, who actually got to meet at, our, at an event we did in Los Angeles, um, she was on my marketing team at Harper, and she told me she'd read my book three times and had never felt so seen before. And you know, very similar to what Ashley was saying. Um, I think that every time I hear that from a fan, it never gets old. It just it matters so much because when I was growing up, I, I wish that I had those opportunities, and so I'm grateful to be able to give that to others. I think one time, 
I was on a set and one of the directors I had worked with looked at me and like a couple of the more like minority ethnicity characters and we were just talking and he was like you guys like write your stories down and share them and he was a minority himself and so I just remember hearing that and being like it sometimes is encouraging hearing it from other people that your voice matters <laughs> we should believe that but you know we have years of, of being told otherwise so that's a good piece of advice for you guys too it's like yeah. you have good stories to share <laughs> Oh, these are all such such meaningful answers. That's that's so so great to hear. Um, all right, as as we start to wrap up, uh, I'd love to fire just a couple of rapid fire questions at you guys. Uh, you know, reading where the movie was filmed. Do you guys have a preference for you know, London or or Taipei or maybe LA or, or another favorite city? What's what's your favorite city? I don't even know how I landed in London. I'm going to be so honest. I got food poisoning on the flight. Like my very first meal. <laughs> Chelsea, do you remember this? <laughs> you helped yeah. me get off that plane. Uh, don't remember. So I think for me, it's going to have to be Taipei. <laughs> nice. Was it just like a general city type of thing? Yeah, I guess general city. Uh, yeah. Oh, general I know, I cities were filmed. I, like, I know. Sorry. Um, I love Japan. I love Tokyo. But I, I love all the Asian cities. I think they're just great. I want to go to Korea. So. Yeah, and I love to travel, so I I have just yeah. endless bucket list of places I want to go. But I, I do love Taipei. I spent a year in Vienna with my younger child, um, and that was we're amazing. We were in Berlin together too. Yeah, we were in Berlin was, together. Yes, yeah, Hunger Games in Berlin. And it was just like it was the most wonderful time. Yeah, <laughs> I think it <was> hours. <laughs> I loved it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping to do a go back to Asia at some point as well, just to see how much it's changed. It's been over a decade for me. Um, uh, and you know, second one, what's what's one fun fact about you guys that we won't see on your bios or IMDb page? I know Google loves fun facts. <laughs> I can move one eye. That's it. Like, it's really not. <laughs> it's nothing crazy, you guys. Like, I just. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. That's my fun fact. <laughs> well, that's super fun. Um, my younger siblings are twins. Oh, that's really cool. So so that's about you, Abigail. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I know I'm outing them, but like, there's that meant that we grew up three within three years. Cool. And so, it was like a party community, and so actually. Um, I would tell them stories about kids in a world without grown ups, and later I realized, oh, that's Love Boat, and that's my next book. Stories about kids in a world without grownups. Yeah. I do have a random thing. I apparently laugh in my sleep. My <laughs> which is so creepy. Like talk about horror movie, but yeah, I've been told that. So that means you're having happy dreams. My I husband, know. I love my dreams. Or something my husband like. actually has work meetings in his sleep. No. <laughs> I'm outing everyone except me. That's so funny. Awesome. Uh, all right, so you know how how can we better support the film and and the books and you know tell us also what's next on the horizon for you guys? How can we you know stay in touch and follow you guys as well? Maybe Abigail, I, I obviously you have a book coming out uh, this summer. Tell thank us a little you, bit about you. that. Yeah, as far as supporting, um, watch the movie, read the books, um, rate. I think our community doesn't tend to rate on social on like IMDb, oh. um, Rotten Tomatoes. Goodreads and Amazon, but those ratings actually really go a long way. The algorithms will push your book and movies out even further the more ratings we have. Um, so please rate. Um, and then I do have my fourth novel. It's its first, it's a standalone. So I think of it as like kind of my sophomore novel. Um, it's called Kisses, Codes and Conspiracies and it's set in Silicon Valley, um, comes out in August. So pre-ordering the book is hugely helpful. The, the publishers actually make a lot of decisions based on pre-order numbers. And then as far as following me, you can find me at Abigail Hingwen or sign up for my newsletter on my website, abigailhingwen.com. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I mean, you can watch our film, uh, Love in Taipei on Paramount Plus. Um, the Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is on digital. It's on 4K. We have an entire behind the scenes. Very cool. Um, the horizon, the future looks good. And I'm excited. Have great hope for the future. And um, if you want to follow me, you can just Plug in my name anywhere and it'll it'll show up on the internet thanks to google right. um by the way <laughs> <laughs> right. um, go to google and type in our names <laughs> yeah mine's similar my handles my name chelsea t zhang you can find me 
and yeah, I would say like support other, you know, Asian American films like Shortcomings is out. Um, watch Past Lives. You watch uh, Nai Nai and Wai Pao. Oh my gosh, it made me cry. I loved it. So, expats. Yeah. There's Go great read books if you want our film too. Like I love reading them. It's great. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thanks again to all three of you for sharing your time with us. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you guys a little bit and and just chatting with you. Um, and, and with that, you know, just wanted to thank everyone for tuning in as well for the audience questions and hope to do more of these in the, in the future. And best of luck to all three of you. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>